Um, I'm really glad you're here. I really appreciate, Chris, that when I suggested I wanted to talk about this, right away you just said yes. I, yeah, thank you. Thank you, and to the library staff. Mm -hmm. So this is Solving the Climate Challenge. Um, I am here as both a concerned citizen and a member of a group called Citizens Climate Lobby. And I'm going to talk about what's going on with our climate and tell you about what we think is a really good solution. Can everyone hear me okay, by the way? Okay. So what I want to talk about is kind of three things. The effects of a, a change in climate. Who is this group, Citizens Climate Lobby, and what solution do we support? And what specific actions can you and I take to maintain a habitable world? There is cause for hope provided we act soon. So who am I to talk to you about climate change? I'm not a climate scientist, and that would be helpful maybe, but in recent months I've become increasingly alarmed about what's happening with our climate. And I've been learning a lot, and one of the most important things I've learned is that we actually don't have to be climate scientists to be concerned, to learn, to get involved, and to act. In fact, I think we all need to act. So I want to tell you a little bit about why I'm so concerned um, and that, you know, what's prompted my involvement. So in life, each one of us has a story, and for simplicity, we sometimes put that story into labels. So here's mine, and I want to tell you how it affects my concern about climate change. I'm mom, I'm a registered dietitian, and I love animals and nature. So as mom, my husband Rich and I have two wonderful boys who have grown up with a great love of the outdoors. They like to bike ride and hike and ski, and here they are after running a race a couple years ago in town. And I want them to always be able to enjoy the beautiful outdoors and the activities that they love. But not only them, I want for everyone's children and all future generations to be able to enjoy this world and the great, beautiful outdoors. As a registered dietitian for about 35 years now, I am very concerned about um, helping people to maintain health and well-being. And I spend a lot of time trying to uh, get people to eat leafy green vegetables, um, like shown up here, or citrus fruits, or lots of other good things. But our health is also affected by our physical environment. And I am concerned that we cannot truly be healthy if we live on an unhealthy planet. Um, so in other words, we can eat piles of kale and Swiss chard and meet our physical activity goals, but I don't think we can really be healthy the way this planet is going. And finally, love of animals and nature. So we all have our favorite spots, and this is one of mine. I don't know if anyone recognizes this, but it's Lake Chauncey in Westboro, and those are my dogs running freely a couple of falls ago, and I just think it's gorgeous in late fall. Um, can you see that okay, or do we need to dim the light a bit? You can see it, okay. Um, so what it is is I want for all creatures on this earth to be able to experience their version of this. And I want for the earth to remain beautiful and safe and habitable. So those are the reasons for my concern, pretty much. Um, you have your compelling reasons, too. And as we're going through this, I want you to be thinking about what drives your concern over climate change. You might have concerns very similar to mine, and you might also have some different ones. So 10 years ago, or even a couple of years ago, this might have been a very different talk. It might have been more about the scientific findings and trying to convince you that climate change is really happening and that it's man-made. Um, that's not what this is about. Uh, that's because really there is scientific consensus now on global warming. You might have heard the figure in the media, it's out there, 97% of climate scientists agree. And actually that's old, that's about a year old now. It's closer to 100% now of reputable, real climate scientists that agree that global warming is real, it's caused by increased greenhouse gases, and human activity is causing almost all of the increase. There is no longer a scientific debate. The world scientific community is in agreement. 
all major American associations of chemists, physicists, meteorologists, they all agree. All national and international academies of science agree, and um, even a lot of former skeptics are now in agreement. So the biggest driver of global warming is fossil fuels. Greenhouse gases are emitted by burning fossil fuels, and we have been burning a lot of coal, oil, and natural gas for around 160 years right now. Um, so the burning of coal became widespread in the mid to late 1800s. You can see that on the x-axis. And it slowly, steadily increased until about 1950. And then the use of fossil fuels just ballooned and went up at a rapid rate, and that's where we are today. So greenhouse gases are changing the climate. Um, and here is, you know, kind of schematically how it happens. As you know, energy comes from the sun, much of it as visible light. Some of that sunlight is converted to infrared light or heat, and some of that is reflected ba back out into space, and some of it stays on the planet and heats it and allows for life on Earth. And that's always how it's been. In a stable climate, there would be equal energy entering and leaving at all times. But satellite data is showing that there's more heat entering than leaving. So what's happening is that the greenhouse gases absorb and trap some of that heat that used to be reflected back out into space. You can think of it as like a blanket. It's been described as a thick atmospheric blanket going around the Earth. And you know how if you're lying with a blanket over you and you're hot, the only way to cool down is to kick off that blanket. And that's what we need to do. The more greenhouse gases, the more warming. Does that make sense? OK, this slide takes a minute to populate. That's so um, the 20 warmest years ever on record have occurred during the past 22 years, ever on record. Each one of those brown ovals is a year. Um, more temperature records are expected to be broken, and the correlation with the production of greenhouse gases is unmistakable. This is just an article I clipped from The Globe in July um, talking about the record-breaking temperatures in Europe this summer and how there was one day in Paris when it was over 108 degrees. And in fact, heat waves just in France alone this summer killed over 1,400 people. Um, so this is not normal. People suffer in the extreme heat um, due to dehydration, heat stroke, heat, heat exhaustion. Um, these people are having fun because they turned on fountains by the Eiffel Tower, but for most people, it's suffering and it's not fun. Um, and the poor and the elderly are affected first and the most. July of this year was the hottest month ever on record. There are more wildfires occurring, as I'm sure you know. Um, these are tragic on so many levels. The loss of homes, the loss of businesses, animal habitats, and the loss of life. And the trees, we need the trees. The trees sequester carbon, and they put oxygen into our atmosphere. So this is just a wildfire from California, just another wildfire. Um, farewell, Icelandic glacier. This is a spot where, until not long ago, a glacier stood in Iceland. Um, in August of this year, they held a funeral for the first glacier lost to climate change. The mourners included many scientists and the, uh, the prime minister of Iceland. Scientists fear that all 400 glaciers in Iceland will be gone by the year 2200. That's less than 200 years from now. Millions of people in the world depend upon downstream meltwater from glaciers. Um, it, you know, they melt a bit in the spring and the summer and people drink that water and a world without glaciers would threaten our water supply and have devastating effects. 
Glacial water is also used for um, agricultural, ir irrigating agricultural land and for powering, um, for generating electricity through dams and hydropower. So here's a whole bunch of what we're up against. Um, and we're already seeing the impact of higher greenhouse gases everywhere. This is not off in the future. These things are happening now in various parts of the world, all of them. The increased temperature, well, we're up about a degree Celsius from pre-industrial levels. Um, so, you know, sometimes people say, so what? What's a degree? Well, first of all, a degree Celsius is almost two degrees Fahrenheit. It's 1.8. But people, you know, you think, well, I don't care if it's 100 or if it's, you know, 80 degrees in my backyard versus 82. But to raise the entire global system temperature by that degree has taken a tremendous amount of heat and done a lot of damage. Um, you might have heard that the experts say they want to keep this increase to no more than 1.5 degrees. It's looking like that's not going to be possible. And, you know, we're hoping that we can keep it to 2 degrees. Um, that might be possible. Four degrees would be catastrophic. So we're also looking at more extreme weather events, floods and heat waves, um, more wildfires. The ice sheets are melting in the Arctic, Antarctica, and Greenland. Um, hundreds of billions of tons of ice are being lost per year. It's just impossible to even think about how much ice that is. And then the glaciers, of course, are melting, not just in Iceland, but wherever there's glaciers. So with the ice sheets and the glaciers, what we have is rising sea levels. And it's predicted that there will be loss of land in coastal communities going a half a mile inland, or in some places, even more. Um, with the increasing heat, we are already seeing, in some places, crop failures, droughts, and good soil Good arable soil is turning to desert. And this, this, again, is happening now. So it's expected that there will be a refugee crisis unlike any that has ever been seen before. Because when people can't cultivate their land and they don't have food and water, they don't stay put and wait to die. They migrate. I also want to mention that species extinction has accelerated. Um, you know, and this is not normal species extinction. This is over a thousand times faster than throughout geological history. It's caused both by climate change mostly and also habitat loss due to like deforestation. You might remember that in May of this year, the a UN report predicted the extinction of at least one million species of animals and plants within the next few years. What I've got up here is some of the ones in, identified by um, the World Wildlife Fund as being endangered. So the snow leopard, the giant panda, the tiger, the green sea turtle, the mountain gorilla, and the Asian elephant. And I know, I mean, to me it feels devastating to think of a world without pandas or tigers. Um, and I know a lot of people probably feel sad about that, but we also have to remember that a lot of very tiny creatures that we don't think about as much, like plants and fungi and microbes, are also being affected and becoming extinct. And it, there's, all, there's a domino effect. So ecosystems are very fragile, and when there's a change in temperature or pH and one being is affected, there again is a domino effect and others are affected in untold ways. Um, for example, for many creatures that migrate, their migration pattern is no longer aligning with their food source. So whether it's a fish or a bird or whatever, they come back and they go too far north or too high up on an elevation because they're looking for it to be cooler. And they arrive and their food source isn't there because it's the wrong place and they starve. Um, there was just last month on the 25th released a UN report um, about how climate change is affecting the oceans, and there's no good news here either. Um, so heat waves are killing fish and seabirds and sea grasses. The increasing acidity is also having an effect. The ocean becomes more acidic with carbon in the atmosphere. Um, so uh, algae and phytoplankton are dying. Now these guys are the base of the marine food chain. 
So when you think about the implications going up the food chain, um, so many people depend on fish, billions of people depend on fish for food, and so many people use fishing as their livelihood. And already fish populations are declining. Um, some things are not declining, though. There's pathogens that are proliferating in the warm water, like, for example, Vibrio, which causes cholera. And in some areas, that's becoming difficult to control. Um, and the coral reefs are being destroyed at a fast rate. The coral reefs are another delicate ecosystem, um, and they're dying. Thousands of creatures depend upon the coral reefs, like fish and sharks and whales and, you know, tiny creatures. And finally, the threat to human health. Um, climate change poses enormous threats. Um, I mentioned just the effect, effects from the heat itself, the heat exhaustion and heat stroke, which can be fatal. Um, pests and pathogens are likely to spread um, so as areas get warmer. So, for example, mosquitoes, which are cold-blooded, love the warmer environments and are expected to spread, and in some areas already are, with their malaria, their dengue fever, yellow fever, Zika, West Nile, and who knows what else. Um, Tick-borne diseases also. Um, ticks are expanding their territory and moving further north, affecting wildlife and us. Respiratory diseases are exacerbated by poor air quality, especially the burning of coal is especially really bad for that. Pollutants from burning fossil fuels are responsible for over 7 million deaths each year. Um, and it's not just in big polluted cities. It's in, you know, it happens in almost all urban centers in particular. Allergies are expected to increase and get worse because with higher temperatures and excessive rainfall in some areas, um, there's longer pollen seasons and more mold. And very scary is the food and water shortages that are already beginning. We're not feeling it here, but already beginning in some parts of the world. Um, and they will hit the poorer parts of the world first. And not to be discounted, for anyone who's paying attention, there's a lot of stress and anxiety that goes along with contemplating all this. I do want you to know that our government has expressed its concern over the changing climate. Um, there's something, there's a report called the Fourth National Climate Assessment that was released a little over a year ago, produced by these 14 different U.S. agencies and departments. I'm not going to read through them all, but notice that the EPA is on there, and NASA, and several departments like Commerce and Agriculture. They agree on the scope of the problem. In fact, the Pentagon stated that climate change is the second greatest threat to world stability, right after nuclear war. Internationally, approximately 190 nations have signed on to the Paris Climate Accord. So, how long do we have? Um, so the IPCC, which is an organization that you might have heard of, they release these reports, and they're very good. They're the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They're comprised of scientists from member nations of the UN and also the World Meteorological Association. They report that we have about 10 years to cut global emissions by 50%. Um, and very important, the next few years are critical because the longer we wait, the harder it is to make up for lost time. Scientists are telling us we need to move away from business as usual. Um, some things that are happening are not reversible. Like when species become extinct, we're not getting them back. When glaciers melt and what we've lost from the polar ice caps, we're not getting those things back. Um, there are certain tipping points or irreversible changes that we actually don't know, like at what temperature the permafrost would melt. That would be catastrophic because the permafrost is a huge carbon reservoir with lots of methane. If it melts, it would just release too much methane. Okay, so I've talked about part one. 
What are the effects of a changing climate? If you're still with me, you've noticed this isn't fun. This is very grim. But I've told you what I know about the effects of a changing climate. Actually, there's other things, but what fits on the slide and the, you know, a lot of the main things. Um, and I, I really don't like it either, if you're sitting here thinking you don't like it. But now I'm going to switch gears and be a bit more positive, because as I said in the beginning, there is hope if we act. And I want to tell you about who is Citizens Climate Lobby and the great solution that we're supporting. To do that, first I have to introduce this guy. His name is Marshall Saunders. He founded Citizens Climate Lobby in 2007. He's probably 80 or 81 right now, and he lives in California. He's not a climate scientist either. He's a real, he was in real estate brokerage. But around 2006, he had been doing a lot of reading and was becoming very alarmed about the changing climate. And he began giving talks about global warming to clubs and universities and anyone who would listen. And he felt very hopeless. He felt like at the end of each talk, the solutions he was offering were not a match for the problem. And he came to the conclusion that ordinary people would have to enter the political process. We're not going to do this without our elected officials, unfortunately, no matter what we think of them. So we, this involves organizing, educating ourselves, and gaining the skills to be effective with our government. So in 2007, he founded Citizens Climate Lobby, and what we do is seek to influence policy leaders by basically meeting with members of Congress and letting them know how important this is. Um, and also conducting community outreach is another big thing that we do. So that was in 2007. Here we are. It's a big organization. There's over 500 chapters worldwide, mostly in North America, and by that I mean mostly in the U.S. and Canada. There's a very big presence in Canada. It's over 100,000 volunteers and growing. Um, it's almost all volunteers, very few paid positions in Citizens Climate Lobby. It's a non-profit, non-partisan, and that non-partisan part is very important. I'll say more about that. Grassroots advocacy organization. Um, we are laser focused on a couple very specific goals, and it's finding the political will for a livable world, political will, getting our elected officials on board, and we want a national solution with global impact. It's not enough even if we get the U.S. going in the right direction. We've got to, it's got to be the world. Um, there are certain core values um, in Citizens Climate Lobby, and they're on the website, but among them are being respectful and collaborative. Respectful to everyone, collaborative. Whoever comes along and wants to help is so welcome. It doesn't matter what political party you belong to or whether you consider yourself to be uh, liberal or conservative, everyone who wants to help can help. So um, in a moment, I'm going to explain the solution that we're advocating in Citizens Climate Lobby. But before I do, what do you think makes a good climate solution? What would you like to see in a good solution? Anyone have any thoughts? Oh, fixing public transportation? Oh, I agree with you. We need that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's got, yes, it's got to be something good for the economy. We can't go into economic devastation, um, you know, ideally. <laughs> we have to fix this problem, but... Okay, well, naturally, I'm going to tell you. So, <laughs> what makes a good climate solution? So, these are the kind of the factors that CCL, my, this organization, will not compromise on. It's got to drive large-scale change quickly. In other words, the time has passed for marginal improvements. We need a solution big enough for the scope of the problem. Um, it's got to use incentives that support choice. Now, what that means is some people don't like being told what to do by the government. So it's got to incentivize people to want to make the right choice. And of course, by the right choice, we mean green choices. <laughs> um, it's got to be fair and not put an undue burden on the poor or the disadvantaged. So it shouldn't be economically regressive, they call it. It's got to be sticky, and sticky means durable. So it's got to be a policy that is um, 
po that has popular support so that a change in political leadership can't quickly overturn it, and that could happen. And finally, it's got to be, of course, healthy for the planet and, and also healthy for the economy. And there is such a solution, and here it is, and it's called a policy of carbon, fee, and dividend. So now I want to say please stay awake. <laughs> because if I was sitting there and someone said a policy, I'd say this is a good time for a nap. But I'm going to explain it. It's a simple, comprehensive policy. Um, what do you do if you want the use of something to be decreased? What do you do economically? Taxes? Well, kind of. Um, you make it cost more. You make things cost more if you want the use to be decreased. So carbon fee and dividend is a policy that puts a price on the extraction of fossil fuels from the ground. The companies like you know, BP and ExxonMobil and the big companies and small companies pay a fee to extract carbon. This fee would start low at $15 per metric ton of CO2 emissions. I'm told that's low, and I have to believe the economists on that. It would grow each year at, at a fairly brisk clip. It would grow by $10 per metric ton per year. So um, the cost of fossil fuels and everything associated with them would do what? They'd go up, yeah, because the companies aren't going to eat the cost, so the cost of everything would go up. Even consumer goods, because even if it's not you know, heating your home or driving your car or flying in a plane, even consumer goods that we buy have to be produced and transported. So the cost of all these things goes up. But hang in there, and I'm going to explain why it might not cost you more. Um, so anyway, as a rule of thumb, just to give you an idea how much things might go up, each $10 per metric ton would add about 11 cents to a gallon of gasoline. So in the first year, it would cost you a couple dollars extra just to fill your tank of gas. And that doesn't include heating your home and other, other sources of fossil fuels. In subsequent years, as it goes up at a brisk pace, it's going to cost you more and more. But there's a couple really good things that would be happening meanwhile. Um, as the cost of fossil fuels goes up, renewable energy sources become more affordable and competitive. Some of them are already coming down. They become more competitive. Fossil fuels are going up, and pretty soon fossil fuel companies, industries, municipalities, everybody is incentivized to develop more and better solar, wind, uh, geothermal, hydropower, maybe something we haven't thought of yet, but green technologies. Um, and we consumers are incentivized to use them because we don't want to be paying those huge prices at the pump or to heat our homes. So it's a, it's a market-based approach. It's relying on incentivizing uh, people. So that's the fee, and I'll say, I can say a few more words about that in a minute, but the other part of this is the dividend. Mountains of money would be collected, and this would be collected by the government. It would be administered by the U.S. Treasury Department, but the government does not keep the money. This is not a tax. It doesn't grow government, even if they were to do something good with it, like put it into R&D for green technologies. They don't. The money goes back to all of us. Every household would get money back in the form of a dividend. There's a bill in the House right now, and I mean the U.S. House of Representatives. It's called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. It's number HR 763, and here's how it works. It's got four main components. I already explained about the fee, um, so it's got the carbon fee. It's got the dividend. The way the dividend works is every adult receives an equal share. Every child under 19 receives a half a share. So, and that's regardless of your family income, so um, you'd get shares like in the mail. You'd get, and it's not once a year like a tax return, it's once every month. So that it, you'd either get a check in the mail or I think you could get a direct deposit. Um, so that's the dividend. There's a carbon border adjustment and this is a really great feature and an important um, component. 
this does a, a couple things. So countries that are importing goods to us but don't have a similar carbon pricing system would pay us a fee at the border. This would protect American businesses from being undersold, and it would also keep shady American businesses from going offshore and saying, okay, I'm gonna produce somewhere else and then just bring the things in, because no, they would have to pay the fee. So um, it protects American businesses, but equally important, um, if you remember I said a few minutes ago, we want something that has global impact. This would incentivize other countries to get their own version of carbon fee and dividend or some kind of carbon pricing because they don't want to be paying the really high fee at our border. Now, a lot of other countries are already on board. We're actually behind. A lot of countries are working on carbon pricing systems and cap and trade. So we, we're the ones that need to get going on this. The limited regulatory adjustment, I'm going to say the least about. All that means is there would be a temporary pause on new regulations for CO2 emissions. We don't even have any good ones in effect right now anyway. But this policy would do more to drive down fossil fuel emissions than regulations would do anyway. So that's OK. OK, so this policy would be Effective, it's good for people, good for the economy, bipartisan, and revenue neutral. And I'm just going to say a few words about each of those, because those are some pretty hefty claims about how wonderful this bill is. Um, but it is. It would be effective. It's supported by climate scientists and economists as simple, comprehensive, and effective. There would be 40% less carbon emissions over the next 12 years. There's no other policy that I'm aware of that would do that. Um, so we would see health benefits, well, you know, almost immediately as once we got the, you know, the burning of coal down, there would be um, less respiratory disease or less severe. So that would be one thing. And then all the other health effects I was talking about could start to turn around. Um, by 2050, carbon emissions would be reduced by 90%. Very, very significant. In terms of the economy, so... Again, families get paid. A family of four, of two adults and two children, for example, would get a dividend of something like $3,456 in the first year. Now, the dividend would go up every year as the fee went up. Um, and again, that dividend would not come as one check, but it would be every month. The money is for people to spend as they see fit, for food, for fuel, for vacation, for whatever people want. It's for the people. Um, this is particularly good for low- and middle-income people. Two-thirds of American households would get more in the dividend, or at least break even, compared to any increases in the price of goods and fuel. So the people that might not break even and be paying more are the people that have a much bigger carbon footprint who tend to be wealthier people anyway, in general. Jobs would be created. Um, it's estimated that 2.1 million jobs would be created over 10 years. Now, some of these would be in renewable energy fields, and that's great. It's going to take a lot of people to produce all those solar panels and to install them. But um, with the dividend coming back to us and going into the economy, it would stimulate growth across the board, and there would be job gains in healthcare, retail, and other service industries. So good for the economy. Um, again, it's revenue neutral, the government doesn't grow, it doesn't keep any of the money, it, it just uses a tiny amount of it to administer this, and the money goes back to people. And finally, again, it is bipartisan, and that's very important to Citizens Climate Lobby. Now, yes, there is more Democratic support than Republican, but we're working very hard on that. Um, so the two, this bill was, it had been in the House in the previous legislative session. It was reintroduced this January in this session, and the, there were many co-sponsors, but the two main ones are these two representatives from Florida, Ted Deutsch, a Democrat, and Francis Rooney, a Republican. So this is very good. This slide 
um, shows all 66 current sponsors of the bill. And it's great. As a member of Citizens Climate Lobby, I feel like I'm getting an email every three weeks or so saying, we got somebody else, we got somebody else. So right now we're up to 66. The last couple are from California and New York and Illinois. Um, so does anyone know how many US representatives there are? Yes, there's 435. So we've got 66, and it's growing. It's not growing fast enough. We need more, but at least it is growing. Um, the ones I've got highlighted in red are the two we've got from Massachusetts. So we've got Jim McGovern from District 2 and Seth Moulton from District 6. Um, how many mass congressional districts are there? Anyone know? 13, 10. There's nine, all close. Um, so there's nine. So we really need to get all nine of them. This is Massachusetts. Well, there's no excuse. We need to get the other seven. So here's an action that people can take. If you don't live in District 2 or District 6, contact your representative. If you agree with me that you think this bill is a good idea, and maybe you need time to look it over, of course, you know, look at the website and everything. But if you think this bill is a good idea, contact your rep and say, there's this bill, I want you to sponsor it. Get your friends and family to do it. It's when they hear from us that they act. They, they, you know, they, they have so much political capital they can spend. They need to know that they're pleasing their constituents. And even if you do live in District 2 or District 6, um, probably a lot of you live in District 2, it's still a good idea to contact them and thank them. It turns out they like to be thanked for things they do, just like all of us. And I'll talk more in a few minutes about how you can contact them. So this solution, this, this bill, is gaining a lot of momentum and it has lots of support. When you go to the website for the bill, which you have on the information I put out over there, and you click on supporters, you'll see that there's tons of supporters. Lots of businesses support this uh, bill. And you know, businesses of a certain size, they put on the website. So I have a little tiny business. I, I'm a supporter, but I'm not on the website. But it, you know, any business can, can fill out a form online and support this bill. And that does have meaning, because our elected officials see that. And they say, oh, businesses are supporting it. Um, a lot of prominent individuals are listed on the site as supporting it. And by that, I mean mayors, state senators, city council members, university professors, rabbis, pastors, ministers. Um, climate scientists, the whole Environmental Defense Fund supports this bill. Um, some local governments around the country, actually over 60 now, are supporting this bill. So as diverse as Los Angeles County, um, Anchorage, Alaska, Rochester, New York, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Salt Lake City, Utah, and about 60 others are supporting this bill. And I see no reason why Northboro, Massachusetts shouldn't be next supporting this bill. Um, more and more communities of faith are supporting this bill. A lot of churches have endorsed the bill. And it's not too surprising. Um, I think every major religion in the world um, talks about uh, the importance of stewardship of the earth and the responsibility for future generations. And some are saying, rightly, that it's morally wrong to turn away from the climate crisis. So it's time for Congress to step up and pass this or similar legislation. And they, we need people like you and I to add our voices to the call for that. Any Wall Street Journal readers in here? OK, well, I'm going to tell you what this is. I mentioned, I've mentioned that there's a scientific consensus about the problem of climate change. There's also consensus among economists that a carbon fee with a dividend is the optimal, maximally efficient way to combat the climate problem. Um, so in, in the Wall Street Journal on January 17th of this year, there was a statement signed by over 3,500 economists, four former chairs of the Federal Reserve. That's all the ones that are alive right now. 27 Nobel laureate economists and 15 former chairs of the Council of Economic Advisors to Presidents. And they were all in agreement that carbon fee and dividend is not only an effective solution, but the most economically effective solution to combating climate change. 
Now these are people of both major political parties and this was unprecedented. It's the largest public statement of economists in history. Okay, so now I've told you about who Citizens Climate Lobby is and the solution that we support. Now I want to give you some actions that you and I can take to maintain a habitable world. And I want to emphasize that we can all act. Even if you feel you can only act in a very small way, and you know, maybe there's times you can act bigger and times smaller, everybody can act a little, and you'll see that. So I want you to be thinking, what is, what's your action plan? You don't have to have an answer now, but think of it when you're driving home, and think of it you know, tomorrow. What is it you can do? Because as we say in Citizens Climate Lobby, we have to move from wait and see to let's get going. The time is long past to say, oh, we're going to take this slowly. There's not time for that. So first of all, anything that you are doing individually and locally, great. We can all thank each other for anything. If, if as an individual, you are trying to eat a more plant-based diet, if you are trying to reduce food waste, to drive less, to make your home energy efficient, to not water your lawn, you know, you know all kinds of things we can do, that's all great. And you might be in other organizations, locally or at the state level, um, and that is great. This is, Citizens Climate Lobby is not the only one, but we're focused on a national solution. So you might have participated in climate strikes, or maybe you're thinking that would be really neat and you would do that next time. So these are all things you can do. However, and unfortunately, it's not enough. This is not going to get solved locally or on the individual level. Those things have to be done, but we have to advocate for a national policy. Um, and I hope you'll consider supporting the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. You've got the web address on the materials I put out over there. Please look over their site um, and also the Citizens Climate Lobby site. The two sites are similar because they're, you know, they're almost one and the same. We, Citizens Climate Lobby, got this bill into the House. Um, so we need to let our elected officials know that climate change should be a top priority. We take for granted sometimes living in the US our amazing access to powerful people like senators and congressmen. They represent us and they are legally obligated to hear our complaints. What does the First Amendment guarantee us? Free speech? Yep, what else? Right to assemble? Redress? Okay. Um, and what else? First Amendment. There's something called the right to petition. Yep. So petition I'm taking to mean complain. Kvetch. We have the right to contact our elected officials by phone by email, don't do it anymore by snail mail. It's going to take them weeks to be allowed to open it. But we can phone, we can email, we can talk about them in public, about how dissatisfied we are. We can show up at their office. You might not get to see them, but maybe you'll talk to a staffer. But if you get a group of enough people, you might get to see them. Um, and this is not the case everywhere in the world, that we can uh, petition or complain without bad consequences. It's extremely easy to contact your elected officials straight from the Citizens Climate Lobby website. So you've got that website on that little blue and green piece of paper that looks like this. You just go on the, across the top, there's a bar. One of the things says, take action. And if you click on that, you'll have the option of writing to Congress or calling Congress. If you click on call, it'll give you who your representatives are because you've put in your address and it'll tell you who they are. So even if you don't know who they are, it's going to tell you. And if you, uh, it'll give you a script that you can change or not change. If you're feeling lazy, you can just read from the script. But if you want to embellish it or change it, you can do that too. Um, if you click on write, it will set up emails for you. You don't have to know their email addresses. It'll set up emails you know, here in District 2 for Jim McGovern, Elizabeth Warren, and Ed Markey. And it give, it, again, it's got a script there. You don't have to change it at all. Or you can change it. You could add in something about how I have children and I'm very concerned about the climate and my children. Um, when I send it to Jim McGovern, I not only thank him for supporting the bill, which comes up. Citizens Climate Lobby knows, of course, who's a supporter 
a sponsor of the bill, but I also like to add a line about please talk to your colleagues about this. So you can do that or not, but it's extremely easy from the site. Um, I, I would urge everyone to please do this, and if you have any trouble with it, please contact me. I will meet you here and show you how to do it. I'll talk you through it on the phone, but they need to hear from us. Um, several recent polls have shown that Americans are increasingly alarmed about climate change. That's good. Um, Two-thirds think the government isn't doing enough, but most people are not actively engaged. Can you imagine if two-thirds of people were actively riding our lawmakers to do something about this? Things would move. They'd move faster. So, and, and by the way, we can't take for granted because we live in Massachusetts that they know that this is a problem and we're all concerned. Um, you'd, you'd think that would be the case, but let's say a few weeks go by and they hear from no one on climate change, but they hear from a whole bunch of people because there's been an, you know, an active effort on some other issue, pick your issue. They might think, oh, well, this is the most important issue for my constituents because they have staffers that keep track of what we call and write about. So they need to hear from us about this often. What I really recommend, who's organized and keeps a to-do list all the time? Anybody live by your to-do list? You do, Elaine. Some of you do. Maybe start. So anyway, what I was going to say is write it down on your to-do list. Contact my reps. And then you, you don't get to cross it off like we like to do on a to-do list. What you get to do is cross off the month and write the next month. That's what I'm doing now, so I don't forget. So I, I did October. I crossed off October. I wrote November. Then at the beginning of November, I'll contact them again. It takes five minutes. Um, so that's something we can all do, you know, easily from home. Here's another thing that you can, I think, easily do, is just share what you know. I know that you know a lot about climate change, or, or even enough to be able to, to talk to people about it. Um, talk to your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. Um, I've been doing this for months now, everywhere I go, and uh, the range of responses is amazing. It ranges from, there's a lot of people that deny that climate change is occurring, that it's a problem, or that it's man-made, all the way to people who think, yeah, it's a problem, but it's hopeless, so why bother? But there's a lot of people maybe like us, or you know, maybe like some of you, that know it's a problem um, and want to get involved, but don't know what to do and feel very alone. So I hope I'm giving you some things that you can do to get involved. Um, back to Citizens Climate Lobby, they really do empower their volunteers. Um, there's a lot of support, education, there's conferences, there's a lot of handouts you can take right from the site once you've joined, um, seminars. So here's what Citizens Climate Lobby members tend to, to, to do. This is what we do. Lobby elected officials, and that just means meeting with them and you know, telling them how important this is and trying to bring them on board with the bill. Um, the meetings can occur in Washington. There's two conferences and lobbying sessions in Washington per year, one in June and one in November. Uh, but they can also be lobbied locally, like in their offices in Boston. And I confess I have not done any lobbying yet. So not everybody does everything. But I've been to a, a session where, you know, at, at one of the meetings they had a lobbying training, and it was fascinating. I learned a lot about it. Um, like, for example, how important it is to be respectful. Um, they said you'd be amazed at how many people show up to talk to their senators and rep and are not respectful. So this organization is very much appreciated. You're supposed to walk in and always find something to thank them for. No matter how much you disagree with their policies, you have to find something to thank them for. So if any of you think that lobbying is something, gee, I might be interested in that, or that sounds kind of you know, challenging or fun, this is a way you could do it if you're interested. This shows um, some, a couple Citizens Climate Lobby members lobbying the staff of Senator Cory Gardner from Colorado in his office in Washington. You don't always get to see the actual elected officials. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But they're with staffers, and Cory Gardner is not yet on board with um, carbon fee and dividend in the bill, but I'm pretty confident that they will wear him down. Um, another thing we do is write letters to newspapers, and some people have written op-eds, and this is what I've been doing for the past year, is writing a lot of letters to newspapers. Um, 
community engagement like this, uh, talking or you know, going to fairs and events and sitting at tables and handing out information and educating people, recruiting members, and seeking endorsements for the bill. So that's a lot of what we do. Um, and there are, by the way, 11 chapters. Every state in the country has chapters of Citizens Climate Lobby. Massachusetts has 11. Um, I know that you've got these web addresses on the materials, but I just wanted to point out the middle one. There's a live info session every Wednesday evening on Citizens Climate Lobby that you can just join in. You can sign up, join in, and hear more about it. And if you miss it, you can get a tape of it. It's very informative. Um, so I would, I would urge you to take a look at the two websites, Citizens Climate Lobby and the bill, when you get a chance. It doesn't have to be tonight. So back to that glacier that I was talking about in the beginning. Um, so they call the glacier OK for short. It's got a long Icelandic name. But they put a plaque on a stone on a spot where the glacier was. And it says, a letter to the future. And I want to read to you what it says. It's, it's in Icelandic and it's in English. And it says, um, OK is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and know what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. So I want to close with some words of wisdom. Um, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. And this is from Mishnah, which is Jewish oral law passed down through the generations. I can't think of anything that applies more to this than the climate change situation. So we have so much to preserve and so much to lose, and we really do have a crisis. It's urgent. I've tried to outline the scope of the problem, and I hope I have let you know that there is a good solution. There's a bill and there's support, but we need things to move faster to address the magnitude of the problem. So in summary, and the statement that I'm about to say is on the, my handout over there, it is critical that we reduce the use of fossil fuels rapidly to reduce the effects of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases threatening life on Earth now and for generations to come. Um, I thank you very much for coming, and I'd be very happy to either try to answer any questions or just to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you so much.